So, guten Morgen, alle miteinander. Good morning, everybody. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here at ETH Zurich for this event, The Role of Universities in the Development of Africa. Uh, Africa is an important country for the future of this planet. Many things will happen there, many things are already happening there, and we are very glad that we have such honored guests from this continent here with us. We have a very demanding program in front of us, so I will start right away. My name is Lina Guzella, I'm director of ETA, and on behalf of the Schulleitung of the Executive Board of ETA, I would like to welcome you all here to this event. I will now make a brief introduction of our first speaker, and then you're all aware of the program we'll meet later on this podium. So it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce to you Professor Russell Botman. Professor Botman is Director and Vice-Chancellor of Stellenbosch University and a Director and Executive Committee member of the Higher Education in South Africa. This is an association of the Vice-Chancellors of the public universities in South Africa, which facilitates the development of an informed public policy. When I read that, I was very interested to hear later how you do that, because it's not easy in Switzerland. How do you inform a policy on higher education and how to encourage cooperation among universities in South Africa? He's a member and the chair of many other committees in South Africa and on the African continent. Professor Botman was born in Blomfontein. He obtained a Bachelor of Art and a Master in Theology as well as a Doctorate in Theology from the University of the Western Cape in Belleville, Cape Town. He was a student's representative at, uh, in the council at that in that university. He served as a minister after it in the Dutch Reformed Mission Church in Winburg, Cape Town. And from his CV, I took that he believes that science should drive Africa's development. And to make his beliefs come true, he has been the prime mover in the HOPE project as a vehicle for the university's transformation and positioning in the 21st century. Science alone will not make it, it's my belief, but without science it won't work. That's my belief as well. Professor Botman receives, ma received many awards and prizes for his excellence and achievements in academic leadership. As a theologian, he was the founding director of the Bayes Nodé Centers for Public Theology in, in, a South, in Stellenbosch University's Theology Faculty, and he served as president of both the South African Council of Churches and the South Africa Alliance of Reformed Churches. He has published many papers in prestigious international journals and he has been recognized as a research fellow and scholar, for instance, by the Central of Theological Inquiry in Princeton and by the Columbia Theology Seminary in Atlanta. Professor Botman remains active in the areas of culture and business as well. He serves on the board of Media24, that's Africa's largest media company, and he is a former chairperson of the Klein Karoo National Festival of the Arts. He's a recognized community leader at Wells. He serves as a chairperson of the Church Development and Dialogue Community Trust, which is driving a large-scale project in the poorest communities of South Africa on behalf of the Global Fund. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Botman. Thank you very much, Professor Gazella, for the introduction. Uh, thank you for, um, for being here. It is very good for me to be here and, uh, that's, uh, and uh, to share a few thoughts with you about South Africa and our continent. My continent is increasingly being identified as a success story. That is the main point that I'm making today. Analysts have noted that the international discourse has shifted from Afro-pessimism to Afro-positivism and optimism. This is largely on the back of the continent's good economic performance. Africa is one of the fastest growing regions 
in the world an increasingly an attractive investment destination. We have a youthful population that is rapidly urbanizing and increasingly educated. In this decade, more than 128 million households are expected to be moving into the middle class of Africa. Get this paper sorted out. Yet Africa's growth has relied on the export of primary resources, especially to fast industrializing countries such as China, India, and Russia. In the new scramble for Africa that people are talking about, primary resources make up 80% of the continent's exports, the highest proportion in the world. This might stimulate short-run growth, but tends to undermine long-term growth because the incentives to diversify are limited. However, exports do not tell the whole story. The good news is that only one-third of Africa's growth the last decade came from resources. The biggest contributors have been agriculture, manufacturing, construction, and services. But nonetheless, Africa still sits low on the UNDP's Human Development Index. Of the world's 42 least developed countries, 50, 35 are African countries. But how should we think of development and what is its relationship to growth? According to the American organizational theorist Russell L. Aikoff, rubbish heaps grow, but that they do not develop. He argues that, and I quote, growth is an increase in size or number, development is an increase in competence, the ability to satisfy one's needs and desires and those of others. End of quote. How do we build and master the ability to do this consistently? As you've heard, my argument is set through education, especially higher education. Higher education forms a critical pillar of sustainable human development. The trained individuals it produces drive economies everywhere. They make civil society stronger, and they lead effective governments. But higher education has not always been seen in the same light. In the second half of the 20th century, there was a strong push for developing countries to place more emphasis on primary and secondary education. At the same time, there was an assumption that higher education in Africa was of lesser importance a luxury for the privileged few with private benefit that cannot be extrapolated to the bigger society. The World Bank decided that development efforts in Africa should be refocused on primary education, which resulted in a dramatic decrease of 82% in per capita public spending on higher education between 1980 and the first decade of the 21st century. This had a debilitating effect on the continent's universities and also delinked them from development. When the world's nations formulated and agreed on the Millennium Development Goals in the year 2000, Higher education was not included at all. Luckily, there were eventually arguments for relinking universities to development. The sociologist Manuel Castells wrote a paper describing the university as the engine of development, and in 2001, the World Bank started embracing the role of higher education in the knowledge economy. Now, universities in Africa can identify with this role, but what is the contribution of Africa 
to international knowledge production. Africa has about 800 universities and more than 1,500 institutions of higher learning. Africa's research output, as measured in share of accredited journal publications, shows a decrease from 1% in the mid-1980s to 0.7% a decade later. The problem is multifaceted and resists simple solutions, but include the following. Access to higher education remains painfully low, yet lecture rooms are overcrowded and academics spend most of their time teaching. Salaries are low and the lure of better opportunities in more advanced nations has led to a brain drain out of Africa. Weak infrastructure hampers scientific investigation, communication and access to information. And institutional bureaucracy and leadership styles inhibit academic freedom. An additional, aspect, an additional aspect is the limited contact that scientists in Africa have with their colleagues in other African countries. Institutions have maintained contact with their former colonial powers, but were slow to build ties with their own neighbors. Lack of collaboration becomes even more pertinent when one considers the crucial role that collaboration has played in the history of knowledge. For this reason, we are prioritizing the development of sustainable and long-term academic networks at my university, the Stellenbosch University. We have formed a number of what we call knowledge coalitions in Africa, Many international partnerships like associations exist in higher education, but there seems to be a well-understood academic pecking order when you look at it well, in terms of which academic opportunities flow mostly from northern partners to institutions in the south. Yet there is no reason why African universities cannot be lead agents in the formation of better partnerships and stronger partnerships. This requires a fundamental mind shift from all of us. We need to accept that Africans too can be valued contributors, not only recipients. A case in point is the Square Kilometer Array Radio Telescope, the SKA, two thirds of which will be built in South Africa and its partner countries, Botswana, Ghana, Kenya, Madagascar, Mauritius, Mozambique, Namibia, and Zambia. As one of the biggest scientific projects ever, the SKA will rival the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider of CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, here in Switzerland, as we complete it in the year 2024. And a lot of the expertise and high-level skills needed for the SKA search for answers to the mysteries of the universe will come from Africa. The technology being developed is cutting edge, and the project is creating a large group of young scientists and engineers with world-class expertise in various technologies. Since 2005, the African SKA Human Capital Development Program has awarded 400 grants nationally for studies in astronomy and engineering. We are confident that the SKA will help us slow the African brain drain, which is the biggest effort that we want to fix by creating new opportunities in Africa. I want to highlight another example of the Progressive Knowledge Coalition, namely the Partnership for Africa's Next Generation of Academics or Pangia, as we call it. The partnership was constituted on African University Day, 12th of November, 2010. It now consists of the universities of Botswana, Dar es Salaam, Ghana, Makerere, Malawi, Nairobi, and Stellenbosch, with further expansions in the pipeline. 
Bangia is a collaborative network in the arts, humanities, and social sciences for now, and is growing to the other fields of study. It can help us reclaim Africa's share in world science by increasing the continent's research output and PhD graduates. Since 2010, our Pangea linked graduate school has registered 88 PhD candidates from 14 African countries. We recently kept the first 19 PhD res uh, recipients from the program. Now let me focus for a moment on higher education in South Africa. We have 23 universities, two national institutes, and a 99, and 99 private higher education institutions. I travel too far with this paper, <laughs> it's sticking. In 2009, what used to be what used to be the government department of education was split into basic education on the one end and higher education and training on the other. That was when the idea of a post-school education and training system as opposed to just universities really got momentum in South Africa. Within an increasingly differentiated sector, we have what are called further education and training institutions as well as adult education centers and levy grant institutions. There seems to be similarities between the aims of South Africa's post-school system and the dual education system found in Switzerland, Germany and other countries. At Stellenbosch University, we differentiate further. We say we want to make a difference in society through academic excellence in our new vision for 2030. In that statement, we say that we pursue knowledge in the service of all our stakeholders. Let me give you some more background about Stellenbosch University. Uh, I'll leave it there a bit longer because it must let you think you should sit under one of those trees one day. Stellenbosch University, also known as Martis, is situated in the historic town of Stellenbosch. 50 kilometers from Cape Town. South Africa has a combined headcount of 521,000 students in the higher education system. Stellenbosch University has approximately 28,000 students, of which more than a third are at the postgraduate level. We have 10 faculties, five campuses, and approximately 940 academic staff members. Now then, there was a time when Stellenbosch University was known as the cradle of apartheid because it had produced a number of apartheid prime ministers. But the university can no longer be characterized in that way. In 1990, the year former President Nelson Mandela was released from prison, Stellenbosch University had only 762 black students. By 2011, the annual enrollment of black students had risen to 9,278, equal to 33% of our student population. Extending access and improving our diversity remains a strategic priority, and we have set ourselves the target of a 50-50 ratio of black to white students by 2018. Now, this new direction of ours was signaled by an important policy statement in the year 2000. It is that we acknowledge the contributions to the injustices of the past and commit ourselves to redress and development. I became rector in the year 2007 and dedicated my time in office to the tangible realization of this commitment. And following broad consultation, and engagement, the university subsequently launched its HOPE project through which the institution's core activities, research, teaching, and community interaction have been focused on eradicating poverty and related conditions contributing to human dignity and health, consolidating democracy and human rights, promoting peace and security, and balancing a sustainable environment with a competitive industry 
in South Africa and the rest of the world. Now, let me turn to Africa's sustainability challenges. Africa's sustainability, the realization is growing worldwide that humanity should be more circumspect in the use of its natural resources. We should do less damage to the environment and reduce our wastage. In short, our ecological footprint must become smaller and lighter. As the 2007 Stern report made clear, poorer countries, especially in Africa, will suffer first and foremost from the consequences of global warming, even though they have contributed least to it. However, climate change can be a catalyst for change if Africa is prepared to build rapidly growing green economies instead of getting caught up in stages of industrial development that have been particularly destructive and resource intensive in the developed world. Now globally, renewable energy is high on the agenda and solar power is one of the key focus areas for a world looking for sustainable solutions to the energy needs. Large parts of Africa have an abundance of sunshine which puts the continent in an excellent position. South Africa receives 50% more sunshine than Spain. If we consider just the area near transmission lines, South Africa could generate 15 times its current electricity demand using solar thermal energy. At Stellenbosch University, our solar thermal energy research group is focusing on CSP or concentrated solar power. Large solar thermal power stations use vast, vast arrays of mirrors that focus sunlight to a point creating a very high temperature on a receiver. One niche that Sturk, our research group, has carved out for itself is the development of heliostats, mirrors that track the sun to do exactly that. Sturk forms part of an overarching structure of Stellenbosch University called the Center for Renewable and Sustainable Energy, or CRES, in our Faculty of Engineering. The center trains engineers and scientists and provides research support to the industry. There's developed a strong academic network engaging a number of other universities you know, uh, institutes and industry partners, local and internationally. And it coordinates research in energy derived from solar, wind, ocean, and biomass sources. Let's look at another sustainability challenge, food security. Now, even in South Africa, the economic powerhouse of Africa, 14 million people are food insecure and 1.5 million children suffer from malnutrition. What we have done to tackle this problem is to form the university, it's the Stellenbosch University Food Security Initiative. This initiative combines the expertise of leading researchers from five of our faculties they have developed a multi- and transdisciplinary food systems approach to tackling the challenges of food security, which is a worldwide problem and therefore requires collaboration, not only across disciplines, but also across national borders. A recent study by Samuel Zeman of ETH, Zurich, James Kosman of Stellenbosch University, Alison Smith of the United Kingdom, uh, the United Kingdom's John Innes Center demonstrates the kind of collaboration that is possible. Their paper is on starch, which is multiple, which is a staple food the world over, but it also has unique properties that made it valuable for bioethanol uh, production. Next, I'd like to turn to an example of research with the potential to have a positive global effect, this time in the field of housing. 
Now, no less than 62% of all urban dwellers in sub-Saharan Africa live in slums. South African policy regarding human settlement is shifting from a once-off housing intervention to an incremental approach of in-situ infrastructure upgrading. But people wait a long time for housing to be constructed. What is needed are partnerships between local residents, the authorities at local level, and researchers having the ivory tower, leaving the ivory tower and getting their hands dirty with real difficult world questions. At Stellenbosch University, postgraduate students have come up with sustainable improvements to the basic corrugated iron shack commonly found in informal settlements in developing nations that can improve lives the world over. It is the result of a transdisciplinary research project by Tsamahap, which is an initiative of the Hope Project. Three postgraduate students stayed on Three postgraduate students stayed in the informal settlement of Enkanini near Stellenbosch to collaborate with, with local residents on the design. Our students call their eco-friendly dwellings the eye shack, with the eye standing for improved, and it entails cost effectiveness and incremental modifications for a safer living. The eye shack is north facing with a roof overhang. Windows are strategically placed in the lining of, this, of, discuss, uh, of disused cardboards, uh, boxes against the walls and roof provides insulation. It also has a small photovoltaic panel on the roof for two interior lights, a motion sens sensitive exterior light and a cell phone charger. Everybody has a cell phone. ETH Zurich researchers, uh, Dr. Michael Stauffacher and Christian Paul helped conceptualize these, these ideas with the students uh, at Stellenbosch. And it led to a successful funding proposal to South Africa's National Research Foundation that will have an impact on the country at large. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in December 2011, the Economist published a special report entitled Africa Rising. The magazine said, after decades of slow growth, Africa has a real chance to follow in the footsteps of Asia. The subheading of the story was very interesting, reversing its decision a decade before to label Africa the hopeless continent. The magazine now called Africa the hopeful continent. In a recent McKinsey survey, it was found that 84% of Africans were optimistic about their future. And an Ernst, Ernst and Young survey showed that 86% of multinationals that are already doing business in Africa were optimistic about the continent's growth prospectives and their companies. Education makes people positive about the future, and universities can honor this trust by putting themselves at the service of society. This, more than anything, will strengthen the space for higher education in Africa. Collaboration will be crucial for this to succeed. Collaboration among higher education institutions in Africa, and also with our partners and supporters in Europe, the Americas, Asia, and elsewhere. Collaboratively, we must carve out the space for higher education by demonstrating our relevance to society. And Africa is a great place to do that. Thank you very much. Now we'll have a rebuttal by um, Professor Antonio Lopreno. I don't need to introduce him to you, I guess. He's the, as I jokingly said before, the boss of all professors in Switzerland. So <laughs> we're looking forward to your rebuttal. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Professor Bartman. 
Uh, well, just as a small comment, you know, to say the boss of all professors in Switzerland, for those who know the semantics of the word boss and of the word Switzerland, they will understand that, especially with professor in the middle, they will understand that the realm in which this being boss can realize itself is extremely limited and getting more limited every day, which is actually a very good thing. What I've been asked to do, Professor Botman, is in very, very few minutes to say something as a quote-unquote response to what you just said and that I had the privilege of reading uh, a couple of days before my colleagues in the audience. And what I've thought of doing is perhaps focusing on those aspects of your talk in which I see the, the widest breadth of differences between the situation you describe for Africa, particularly for South Africa, and the situation we observe it in our academic world in Europe, particularly in Switzerland. So, of course, I can only do that for a variety of reasons uh, by sketching very roughly and concentrating on very few issues in hopes, of course, that in, in the debate we might um, go uh, further into that. And, and I'm going to do that also in a, precisely in the way you did it, not in a marketing sense, you know, saying how good we do things, although we are very good at saying how good we are, <laughs> which is also correct, but, uh, the, but also on seeing the limits and the conditions within which we are so good and perhaps why we shouldn't always think that we are so good in everything, but we can certainly learn also from an ongoing dialectic situation, which is the one you described for our continent, for your continent. Uh, the first observation uh, that I would make concerns a, a fundamental difference and probably the most uh, flagrant difference that I observed between what you said and our own situation, which is the strong feeling of social mandate that universities have in Africa. And this, this social thrust, I would say, was pervasive in everything you said. Generally, I would say that in our continent, European universities have chosen to focus on something else than their social mandate which doesn't mean that they disregard it altogether. But the, the frame, the reference framework within which we operate tends to be more and more, especially in recent years, one of institutional excellence rather than of social mandate, if you see what I mean. That is, we tend to concentrate very strongly in our own reading of universities and their function on features that can allow our own institution to become good at what it does, rather than serving society as a whole. Once again, I would not like to be misinterpreted, which does, does not mean that this dimension is excluded, but it means it, it, ha, it is probably less present in our leadership ideas, in our vision, quote unquote, uh, of uh, then, then it is the case in what you describe for Africa. And this leads, this major difference leads to a variety of dialectic points that I would like to raise. This very interesting opposition, Akoff's opposition between growth and development. You said something very important. You said that in Africa, universities historically in recent years delinked themselves from development. And, and that is, uh, um, a, a function that, or a, a, a purpose that they need to recover in the future. I would say conversely that in Europe, universities have gradually delinked themselves from growth. So we have, uh, so it, also because of demographic trends within Europe, in Switzerland, uh, more than in, in uh, other countries. And, and what I'm going to say now might seem for the Europeans among us that read every day in our uh, Sunday press, 
with all due respect for Sunday press, <laughs> but uh, that our, our um, so classrooms are full of, uh, of students and we don't really know how to manage them. Well, well, if you look that at the world level, that's not quite the case. Hmm? So we, we are historically, in terms of the continent, we are not facing an explosion of number of students, but rather a contraction of number of students. And this is something that also, uh, uh, makes our university or causes our universities rather to concentrate on the idea of development than on the idea of growth, right? And develop mostly interpreted as we will uh, see from the point of view of research. Um, this also causes in some cases um, some concerns in terms of the critical mass in some fields. In, in Europe, we tend sometimes also to be a little bit quantitatively challenged, so from the point of view of academic development in some fields where we, we, uh, we would like to have, also in terms of knowledge society, to have more academic presence at the younger level. And I'm thinking here particularly of the natural sciences and, and life sciences. The third uh, point I would like to make as uh, uh, difference, which is, uh, is something that I would like to, to um, formulate in terms of an opposition between something you, a concern you expressed of freedom, academic freedom, and something which I would formulate as institutional autonomy. European universities in recent years have rather concentrated on expanding the realm of their institutional autonomy. Now, mind you, this also has something to do with this loss of social thrust or of social mandate in the self-understanding uh, of universities. I think that European universities have become, over recent years, somewhat suspicious about being integrated as university into a grand societal project, as it were. European universities have rather stressed their dedication to a particular function, production of knowledge, research within societies, but have been very prudent on being involved in grandiose uh, uh, general projects. We can see that in, in, I would say, probably in Switzerland even more than in other countries, but to give you a, a, a a sense of, of what I want to express by that. You mentioned a very important uh, problem of issue in contemporary society at the world level, energy. Now, it so happens that in Switzerland, for a variety of reasons, the government has uh, decided to devote some money, substantial amount of money, to increasing the uh, academic attention to research. And I think it's fair to state that the response of Swiss universities have, has been, well, thank you very much, but let us, let us decide, quote unquote, bottom up, how research in this field should develop, rather than investing a lot of money for which we probably don't have right now the sufficient ma critical mass to, to really generate excellent research. Once again, I'm not at all connotating, I'm not saying whether this is good or bad. Well, I would say this is good, right? Because I, I'm also a partisan of the system. But I think, uh, so the important thing is it needs to be defined before, before we really uh, can discuss whether, how to proceed. It, it, it has to do with the different social situation in which we are, South, South Africa and Switzerland. Four point is the, what you said about the involvement that African universities need to have with all stakeholders of society, political, private sector, uh, industry, uh, local governments, and so on and so forth. I think that uh, on the issue of private sector, uh, I would say it, it, this is still a little bit of an, of a non-resolved love at the, uh, at the level of European uh, university landscape. One thing which is important to keep in mind is that when we speak of European universities on the whole, we speak of extremely strongly state-funded universities, even if they are not always strongly funded. They are strongly funded at the, they are funded with a great percentage of public money. 
And this, for a variety of reasons that we can uh, debate, has also created a little bit of a dialectic relationship with the intervention of private money within the, uh, the university. Uh, I come from a university, I'm from a city, which happens to have, for good or for bad, mostly for good, pharmaceutical giants, uh, two particular pharmaceutical giants that are present in the city of Basel, and every African or Asian university leader that comes to visit Basel says, oh, this is really a wonderful situation. I cannot imagine how many institute chairs, departments, these two pharmaceutical uh, so giants have funded in Basel. And I say, oh yeah, we have about two scholarships from X and about 150,000 a year from Y, which is a little bit exaggerated, uh, exaggeratedly prudent, but it gives you a sense that somehow, probably, the intervention of the private sector, all generalizations are always have an element of exaggeration, but on the whole, the intervention of the private sector in the life of European universities, when they are strongly funded at the, at the state level, is not yet a success story. This is some, and, and there is a, a considerable amount of intellectual population in Europe that looks with some suspicion at the high presence of private money in universities. So there is this kind of public understanding of university. Fifth point, I, so I have eight, so uh, it, uh, it will be uh, fast, is uh, something you said uh, about the need that African universities uh, uh, so sense to increase their good collaboration at the continental level. You, you said that, Europe, that African universities tend to look at partners outside Africa, especially in terms of, uh, of their former uh, colonial powers. I would say this is something, and, and, and I think if we, if we do something well, we, we should also say it without always have a, having a reservation. I think this is something where the European university landscape has progressed enormously in recent years. I think on the whole we can say that we have within the frame of this privileging institutional excellence, as I said before, uh, this is something where the European research network has established itself in a very international way that we saw so that we can consider that to be a lesser problem within, uh, and this is something where we might perhaps be of some uh, interest to you or, or some uh, coaching, we could take a coaching uh, function in, in the development of African universities. The point of brain drain uh, that you, uh, that you uh, so elicited is something where, which in Europe now presents itself in a slightly different way. I think we, uh, if we look at it at the continental level in general, I think we can say that we have stopped the brain drain, especially towards the United States. In some areas, it's rather the other way around, that now, especially state-funded, Great American universities are shrinking their budget, and so this is, this is good for the development of our research strong universities. On the other hand, there is another form of brain drain that does not concern Switzerland or only in terms of importing countries. But there is indeed now in Europe, within Europe, a brain drain at the continental level, especially from Latin-speaking Europe to uh, Germanic-speaking Europe uh, that has to do with the development of the economic system, of the academic systems of our uh, neighboring countries uh, to the west and to the south, that has created a, 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 a movement of which tends to make European countries somewhat poorer within Europe itself. But again, it's a brain drain that at the continental level rather makes the central European countries, Switzerland in particular, more receptive than, than, than the other, uh, than the southern uh, part of the continent. A very important difference that I would also see in connection with what you said about the social mandate of universities is that generally speaking, European universities have lost their interest in humanities and social sciences. European University in recent years, with one big exception, which is Germany, 
but European universities have concentrated in the last 10 years very, very strongly on a certain uh, form of, uh, of scholarship, of science, of hard science, far more than used to be the case in the past. That is, they, uh, there is, generally speaking, perhaps lesser of a humanistic approach to higher education, which transpires very strongly in, in what, you, with what you said, and that I connected with this recognition of the social mandate of the university. Generally speaking, we, we, together with our being somewhat prudent about our social mandate and concentrating rather on the institutional excellence, has gone together a form of concentration on the importance of research over teaching, which is somewhat of a paradox. About 15 years ago, there was this monumental reform in Europe, more or less successfully organized, where we said, well, we, not we in this room, or very few in this room, uh, said, well, let's now focus on teaching and have a, a harmonized, continental-wide form of teaching. For a variety of reasons, European university landscape has developed over the years more in the sense of focusing on research, on institutional competition, and lesser, less on harmonizing teaching structure. Very, very uh, perverse uh, development of history, but that's the way it is. And that has gone together with a somewhat restrictive view of the role of humanities and social sciences within the university landscape in general. As I said, big exception is Germany. Germany invests for many historical reasons very strongly on that. Um, generally speaking, uh, I, and this will be my last remark, I think that uh, there is a, um, a, uh, perhaps a, a kind of polar difference or polar opposition that um, transpires from what you say and we, if we compare it with our experience uh, in Europe. And I, uh, I would use the two um, words or the two constructions which, depending on how you interpret them, can be very similar and very different. I would say that you, African universities get, go very strongly into the way of educational quality. And I use the term education in its global encompassing sense and quality, also in this global sense. And European universities rather go the way of scientific excellence, if you see what I mean by that. Educational quality and scientific excellence needn't be in opposition to each other, but they represent a somewhat a slightly different approach to the same uh, virtues uh, of academic life. In the Swiss Rector's Conference, we had an exercise in recent months, uh, which was that of explaining to each other one's own institutional strategy. So how the 12 Swiss universities view their own future within the next five or six years. And one thing that struck me, not as member of the group, but as historian of culture, if you will, is that one sentence was not only present in all institutional strategies, but at the top of all institutional strategies of the 12 Swiss universities was excellence in research. Now, even in the best university system of the world, which is, of course, ours, that won't fly. So it's clear that it's unrealistic that we have 12 institutions that are all excellent, top-notch research. But that gives you a sense, perhaps, of where the institutional foci are put and where our common thinking goes. In this sense, this is something, that will be my last sentence, this is something where I think we might indeed, or we not we might, we should indeed learn from you. A little bit uh, recovering a higher degree of attention to global societal, um, to a global societal presence than we have trained ourselves to do in recent years. Thank you very much.